All right, welcome to this updated XS as a guide, my friends. Why updated? Because I've brought out an update in April 28th of 2022. So what is XSS? We'll talk about the context a little bit. We'll talk about the types of XSS, but not like it says right here. I've added a lot to that. How to test for cross-site scripting, then getting around filters and raising the impact. Now, what is cross-site scripting in general? Cross-site scripting basically allows when an attacker is allowed to inject client-side scripts. So what do I mean by that? JavaScript usually runs in a browser. There's also Node.js, which makes it run as a server, but we'll ignore it for now. It usually runs in a browser, let's say. So for that reason, attackers, if they are allowed to input user input, they might be able to if that user input is not filtered, inject some code in there and that code might get executed. That's the basics of cross-site scripting. This happens because our developers don't sanitize the input properly and then you have a big problem. XSS attacks are possible in any scripting language, so not just in JavaScript. That's kind of a myth because it's most common in JavaScript though. Now, as for the context, you will see that there are quite a few cross-site scripting contexts out there. We'll focus mostly on the top three, but first we'll have to look at the types of XSS because I think that's important. There are many attack types possible, such as reflected versus stored, DOM basis sor versus source, blind cross-site scripting, mutation cross-site scripting, and CSTI. Those are the types that we'll look at, but know that there are even more than this. These are just some that I've picked out. So let's look at reflected first. That is pretty easy. The user gets an attribute, a parameter, and on that parameter, what they will do is they will inject their code, but that code is then reflected on the page and never stored anywhere on the system. Then it's usually reflected and it means that I can pass my URL on towards another user, another victim, and if they click on it, my cross-site scripting attack might trigger. It's never stored, I have to pass it on, so it is interaction full, not interaction less, meaning I have to have some kind of interaction, pretty basic, all of this. So that means that, of course, Again, sanitization is not properly applied. The user can then apply JavaScript code to the page, which is very bad for your reputation, of course. Note that this can occur with post calls as well. Not only get calls, but you'll have to add CSRF into the mix. I have some labs on that, more about that later. Then you also have the types of XSS being stored cross-site scripting that is kind of like reflected, but our value gets stored in a database somewhere and then reflected somewhere on the page. Can be JavaScript, can be HTML, can be HTML tag attribute, but we'll look more into those later. Now, it also means, of course, again, that your user input is not sanitized properly and we have to have a write mechanism to the database or to any data source and of course, we have to read it and reflect it on the page as well. This user input can then contain malicious code and you have a interactionless cross-site scripting because another user can just stumble across this and you have interactionless. Now, stored cross-site scripting might sometimes turn into self cross-site scripting. What do I mean by that? If I have stored cross-site scripting in my own account, nobody else can go into my account. So that is self cross-site scripting. You can still elevate that. Now DOM cross-site scripting, DOM is the document object model. So sometimes you have a website, of course, that website has a document object model and a source. That source code is something which we can inject our code into but the code can also be injected into the DOM, into the document object model. We do that through DOM syncs. I've put one on screen right now, the inner HTML, that is one of them. But of course there's more. If you want, Portswigger has a great list on this and JavaScript has a lot of DOM synced, but jQuery has even more. 
don't look for this manually let tools do it for you let them find dumb things and then try to exploit it manually of course again labs on this as well the most common sources of this come from windows.location your url and then usually in the query string that is where the parameters occur or in the fragment portion now the fragment portion is often reflected cross-site scripting why is that because if you see that hashtag sign here that fragment as they say well then that basically means and i'm sorry about that background noise by the way um but that basically means that that data never goes onto the server so that data is only read, read by the browser and never written onto the server somewhere that means reflected cross-site scripting is there possible and it's then if it goes into a dumb sync then you have dumb cross-site scripting we have those two dumb versus source stored versus reflected both can occur of course you can have stored source-based cross-site scripting and stored dom-based cross-site scripting but also reflected source and dom-based cross-site scripting are you still following because it might get confusing after a little while but my labs will show you more about that of course then when talking about types of xss we have blind xss as well which is when i enter a payload and i cannot see the result so if i'm talking about a um user if you have some user queries uh, contact sales or contact customer support or whatever as long as it's written somewhere into a database and you don't see it if it's then later retrieved then you have blind cross-site scripting little fun anecdote this heavily relies on out-of-band servers meaning you have to have a server set up that is listening for callbacks because you are basically going to wait for a callback but you're not going to wait yourself you're going to have a server set up and then server is going to alert you when something happens i had this happen where i insert my own attack factor into all of the scripts that I, into all of the articles that i write because i know that the websites that i publish on are safe for these types of cross-site scripting at least but i still got a callback somehow from that article and i was like how is this possible well it turned out somebody had copied that article and put it on their own website kind of type of blind cross-site scripting since i never knew that the, the outcome until they posted it on there not really of course because i could have always noticed it and seen it but still a little fun story so what do we mean by mutation cross-site scripting well basically we're going to send a broken attack vector and these, the browser is going to try to repair it this has been discovered in 2013 um, and it's relatively new in the sense that of course relatively new is kind of relative there's seven years there's ten years sorry nine years that went by since this was discovered um, and since the browser is making a broken payload into full xss that is the mutation that is happening there this bypasses the DOM completely. Really fun technique. Then we have CSTI as well, or client side template injection. Sometimes client side templating engines are being used to uh, make things easier for developers because they can just use components to build their UIs. But that does sometimes open the door for cross site scripting if you're not careful and if you configure your engine incorrectly so that i just wanted to illustrate there is a lot of types of cross-site scripting and then we haven't even talked about the context yet which can be an html tag attribute i can literally insert my attack factor into the code anywhere that i want and it'll produce some kind of javascript code if i insert javascript code there it will reflect onto the html page but this is the HTML tag attribute. I mean, sorry, my bad, of course. So let's say that I have a prompt. I'm asking something from a user. Uh, and if that user, if, for example, I'm asking something from them, if that user answers, I think I have the wrong. I'm sorry about that. That was the wrong order. So 
HTML, XSS context. Let's not mess this up again. So you have cross-site scripting in the HTML tag attributes. So in the HTML tag attributes, what do we mean by that? Let's say I have an HTML tag input. I have an attribute on load and I can insert my cross-site scripting a tag vector in there. I will have to break out of this first. And that is what we meant by that, of course. That is this type of a tag vector. Now, uh, something went wrong because you can also do that into JavaScript. This seems to have gone correctly. Now, what do we mean by that? There is literal JavaScript running in the back end, and you might be able to break into that JavaScript like you see right here. It is ended by a single quote. We can insert our own single quote, and then we can insert our own JavaScript code in there if we would like. Um, then we also have the HTML tag that is literally an HTML code itself. Something went a little bit wrong with my slides there, but I think you get the point. Literally in the HTML code itself is also possible. And then it's not even about the JavaScript code or any tag attributes like we see right here, but it will literally be somewhere here in the HTML code. So somewhere over here. So those are the type of contexts, at least three of them. Let's move on to how to test for this because it's not easy. So for the JavaScript injection, you're going to enter a double quote, a single quote, and a backtick into every single field that you see. Then for HTML injection, you might want to enter a image source equals X, a broken image. And then if you see that broken image, you might want to test further. And then for HTML attributes, you might want to enter single quote, double quote, back tick, and then for all of them, possibly a closing tag sign as well, a greater than sign. Uh, you don't have to enter all of them. You can literally just enter single quote, double quote, uh, greater than sign, and then enter your broken image in there. That is the active method. The passive method is by entering. So what you're going to do is you're going to check for reflections as well. If that is reflected somewhere in the code, that's great. The passive method is if you take some attack factors and you insert them everywhere, some random attack factors. The thing is, this is a lot faster, of course, because you don't have to investigate as much. You're just looking for that pop up, but you just hope that it pops up somewhere down the line. You're never 100% sure. And the thing is, you're never 100% sure what you're doing either. You're literally just testing every parameter. And it might be a little bit mind numbing. I think this is not the right way to test for cross site scripting. You can do it, of course, while you're testing for other things, but later on, you should investigate further. So the passive method has low effort requirements. It's easier to find hidden features but it is not very effective to me. Now, when we look for reflected cross-site scripting, what we're going to do is something very similar. We're going to test every entry point, submit a random value to it, determine reflection, and test a payload based on the reflection. So we're going to, if it's reflected in the JavaScript code, test a JavaScript payload, for example. For stored cross-site scripting, we can do exactly the same, only we have to take into account that our attack vector gets stored on the server and might be recalled at any point later on. And for DOM cross-site scripting, you're gonna test your DOM syncs. Now remember, DOM cross-site scripting can only be tested with the Chrome or Firefox or Internet Explorer, whatever you use um those developer tools because of course you are not looking at the source code we're looking at everything around that and it only happens when you actually run a web page you're going to look for random values again if your string appears in the dom you need to identify the context craft the exploit based on the context in this case dom cross-site scripting and see if we can bypass any filters Speaking around filters, we have two types, black, blacklist filters and whitelist filters. Blacklist filters are going to block certain attack factors, whereas whitelist filters are going to only allow certain requests if they match a specific pattern. Uh, that's often pattern-based as well, but it can be separately pattern-based because you can have pattern-based blacklist filters as well. 
It really depends, but usually you will have literal word lists that are used be, being used for blacklist filtering. Um, and then also some smarter filtering going on. Now, speaking about those filters, I have a lot of labs on them. I'll go a lot deeper into them and I'll go into a separate chapter about what can be filtered and how we can get around it because there are definitely some filters. And even if you can enter only an email address, for example, we can still get around it. Now, in the hard days, you used to go for the cook. In the olden days, I mean, you used to go for the cookies. That has gotten a lot harder because everybody knows about the HTTP only flag. Right now, what we want to do usually is steal CSRF tokens, but you can also execute keyloggers, for example. You can steal data from the page. You can run a crypto miner if you'd like. Anything you can do with JavaScript is something you can do as well with cross site scripting. So that's it for this chapter. Thanks for your attention. Good luck in my labs because those are probably next and I'll see you in the next one. Bye amazing hacker.